I'd like to invite uh, questions from the audience um, for any of the speakers. Can we have a microphone for the question? Um, uh, my question is, uh, I suppose, directed to either Russell or Robert. Um, Mark Subex, my name from Permis to Lisa. Um, firstly, I enjoyed your presentation very much and uh, congratulate you on a very comprehensive study. A few questions I, I have. Whilst your studies were energy focused, um, what influence do you think uh, modelling on comfort parameters would have, um, particularly things like uh, radiant asymmetry on hot surfaces, um, effects that you could have maybe by removing you know, air on the to perimeters? Um, as well as uh, heat recovery in the uh, active wall system. Well, I, I, I think you've hit the nail on the and, head there. And glare control too, because yeah. we find that glare is set, blind set points are usually glare dominated rather than heat dominated. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it's hopefully usually a combination of glare and, and uh, you know, daylight as well, which obviously interact with, with each other. Um, I think with regard to the, the issue of thermal comfort, you know, the energy that, that is going to be incident upon the glazing system itself uh, is going to create a radiant effect. And so, uh, you know, whatever you can do to limit that radiant effect uh, that ultimately impacts the thermal comfort of the occupants is going to have a, you know, what I would believe is probably much more significant impact as, as opposed to the energy. I think that... Uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those who also worked on Pearl River, one of those of many in the room who've worked on Pearl River. I think the, the idea of having that uh, uh, internally ventilated cavity wall and being able to do something with the energy that ends up in there that you're trying to remove, if you can recover that in some way, make it useful uh, as a source for something else, whether it's uh, a source for cooling, a source for dehumidification, a source for free reheat or, or whatever, then you've, you know, you've looked at it in a much more sort of interactive way. And that's something that we would look at very specifically uh, on a particular project. So, you know, you're going to do a deeper dive for that specific project rather than something quite so general like this. I think also with the, the, the double facade system, particularly um, the one that was used on Pearl and been used elsewhere, is that when you have a blind system, trapped in the cavity there. It's obviously based on the fact that the sun is on the, the facade and that becomes fully operat operational at that point. And assuming that we have a perforated blind in there as well, that's also giving you some level of glare control as well. So it's kind of trapping the hot air in the cavity which is being extracted at a high level. I mean, the hot air is still in the building and the chillers are still reading that load, but we're actually trying to mitigate that kind of heat build up and obviously the, the, the transfer of heat into the space for the occupants. Joachim Faust, uh, HPP Architects. I was surprised that uh, the underfloor air distribution is doing so well. There is this conflict of all the other utilities that you have in the floor. Can you say something about that, Robert? <clears throat> so from an energy perspective, obviously there's, a, there's an ideal, you know, that you're attempting to model, right? So, yes, in, in the real world, uh, during design and construction, you know, there, there are things that are not necessarily incorporated into the model. Things like how you control uh, uh, where, you know, where the air is going, you know, do you have it properly sealed? Do you have uncontrolled air leakage? Do you have controlled air leakage? All of those things relate to, you know, having to bring more outside air into the building that you then have to condition. So, there's certainly the potential for that system uh, to, you know, be an energy penalty. Now, in terms of how it sort of integrates with the other systems, you know, the, whether it's a structural cabling system or whether it's, uh, you know, conduit that's being routed through the, through the floor, certainly that's a, that's a, can be a significant issue. I think what we found, um, and I know there are others in the room who have, you know, worked on these kinds of projects, is that by and large, underfloor air systems are low velocity, low pressure systems. And so when you have impediments inside, you know, a, a fairly open floor plenum, uh, the negative impact on energy is really fairly marginal. When you start to drive down the depth of the floor plenum and, and now you've 
you're, you're having to deal with a, a much bigger obstruction, if you like, in what is a, you know, a very big duct. These are kinds of thing, the kinds of things that you don't have to deal with when, hopefully, when, when you're running duct work uh, with a conventional overhead system, you don't have those impediments in the duct work, right? But um, yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly a coordination issue that, that's very real that you have to take a, account of as you're sort of designing and, and building it. But from an energy perspective, that should not necessarily uh, uh, be a penalty. I think also with the underfloor air distribution, it also depends what other systems are working with it. Because on Pearl River Tower, for instance, we were only using air um, as makeup air. We weren't using air to cool the building because the cooling was happening from the radiant chilled ceiling. So, so you're not pushing an awful lot of air through that floor system anyway. And so, what we found there was, from an occupancy comfort point of view, that was which we didn't really address in the study because. It's not that easy to address. Um, you know, that, that, that is obviously a very high-performing combination of uh, air distribution, facade system, and, and cooling system. I'm from Hyundai, and I would like to ask uh, Mr. Hank. And uh, just you mentioned uh, <coughs> temperature inside of the closed cavities higher than other, uh, other kind of the double skin facade. And would like to know, this is uh, in fact for the uh, compatibility of the occupation inside. Would like to know. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, just you mentioned, uh, inside, uh, temperature inside of the closed cavity is more higher than other kind of the double skin facade. And this is um, influence big influence for the occupation inside, because this is more higher and will be transmitted to the inside. <coughs> okay, yeah. thank you. The, uh, the difference is not so high. Um, definitely lower, uh, the, so the closed cavity facade gives a lower surface temperature at the inside than an active hole, and this is because the, double, uh, the, the blinds are closer towards the inside, so the only thing you can do is evacuate the hot air, but then it's just, the air is already in the cavity. And with the interactive facade, you're right, but uh, it is not so significant. And the reason is because your double glazing or your triple glazing, depends on which area you are, is so much more efficient than the single glazing that, uh, that uh, the most of the heat is going out anyway. So um, it is slightly higher, you're right, not so significant, perhaps one or two degrees. Uh, this question is for Thomas. Uh, for the Maritime Museum project, if I understand correctly, the curtain wall is a double curved surface, right? Uh, the, uh, for the Maritime project, if I understand correctly, the, the curtain wall is a double, sur double curved surface. So uh, how, how can you actually maintain the shape of the cable? Um, you are uh, asking about the um, shape of the double curved cable uh, wall. Um, it is uh, an anti-clastic uh, uh, curvature um, shape and uh, it has been uh, developed following a form finding process. So you, in, in the computer model you, simul uh, you, you simulate uh, the piece testing and uh, then you come up with a, a shape which is determined by the um, uh, stiffness and the sections of the cable and the amount of uh, piece testing forces rather than by the architecture. For these cable structures, uh, the, um, follow, the, the, the shape follows the um, stress levels uh, and cannot be uh, like architecturally be de uh, determined. So, and, uh, but the uh, major feature is that because of the uh, two-way curvature, the uh, deformations after piece testing are fairly small. Because in, in both directions you have a um, line of, uh, um, of, of a hanging cable, in, uh, basically, which is uh, already in, in a good curvature to withstand either uplift or uh, pressure loads. Hmm? Uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, I have one, one question for, for Thomas. Um, being a, a person who thinks a lot about wind, I'm wondering about these, when you had some long span cable supported uh, glass systems, uh, do you ever have, have you had any issues of people just noticing deflections? The deflections may not be a problem in themselves, but is there a kind of a human worrying uh, problem? 
So we, we have uh, um, engineered and uh, consulted on many of these uh, flat uh, cable net facades uh, all over the world. Of course, a major feature is that uh, the uh, whole system is uh, designed to be flexible enough uh, with all the joints and uh, especially uh, at the doors, um, you, you need uh, moving joints in order to um, accommodate the uh, large deflections uh, that uh, come along with uh, high wind gusts. So um, an inherent feature of the system is that it, it can deflect, but uh, the deflection is uh, somewhere up in a height of uh, 50 meter the, the maximum uh, and on a, only under strong winds so that um, nobody will, will ever be uh, hurt and the, the whole system will uh, not be damaged uh, even uh, with large storms. But as a, a basic principle, uh, a deflection of uh, about L over 60 uh, will be allowed um, instead of like L over 200 or L over 300. And uh, this is the, as, as a rule of thumb determining the tension forces. Otherwise, you would need to uh, come up with uh, beam elements which would be much more solid and disturbing the uh, view. I mean, all, all the um, solutions I have shown are uh, customized, uh, specialized and uh, uh, tailored uh, solutions to um, very uh, demanding and innovative uh, architectural uh, dreams. So um, the, my point is that uh, nearly anything can be made. Uh, it uh, just needs a uh, proper um, uh, engineering and uh, proper collaboration between uh, all the participants uh, uh, involved in the project, including the internal testing. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? I have a quick question for Hank. Um, closed cavity facade, um, I take it uh, to mitigate cond condensation. You have a uh, dry air supply coming in. How big are these uh, MEP units? Okay. How big is the uh, MEP unit that has... Uh, the, cool, the, uh, the, the compressor system, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, the, it's, uh, it's easily from here to the wall, up to there. So in this corner. And they're, they're supplying it, for it, every unit? or No, this is for the whole building. For the whole building. Yeah, and the reason is because you don't need a lot of air. It's not the, the idea of pressurizing your facade. It's just to blow in very dry air to maintain it below the dew point temperature so, uh, so that you don't get surface condensation. So it's not really pushing. We're allowing the, the, the facade uh, to actually push out and suck in the air just by blowing this dry air in a very small volume. You overcome condensation. Just one more. Um, for naturally ventilated facades, uh, for the region around uh, China and, and some of the Asian countries, there's a lot of uh, dust and, yeah. and other, uh, other particles. Has that been a big factor in, 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 in designing and, and, and maintaining? Those, yes, uh, uh, that, that, that means that you have to regularly clean your facade. And, uh, and that is then where the issues rise, why we have come up with a closed cavity facade. So cleaning means that you have to access the cavity. If you do it from the inside, you have to open the door. You, you need to have a door to open it. And that is disturbance for the, for the occupants. Uh, also, that is, has a cost. And, um, and that's basically the most important principle of closing it completely, avoiding that dust can come in. Also, you have to make sure that the materials that are in your cavity, like blinds and so on, are well tested, that they don't produce uh, dust themselves. So we have, I've shown uh, this accelerated testing system where we are actually uh, investigating which materials can be or robust enough and do not produce dust. It's very important. Moshe uh, architect. In case of closed cavity, if you have some problems with the motor of the moving blinds, you should replace all the whole panel. So, sorry, I didn't understand for you. If uh, uh, there are some uh, problems of the motor, of the moving blinds, you have to replace the whole panel? No, no. There is an access. There is simple access, either in a the full ceiling, or we have kind of, of a, uh, it's a top-hung glazed system that you can uh, lift it. And the other thing is, and this is very important, they have been intensively uh, tested on durability. So if you would go to the normal manufacturer, they will fail very early. We, have, we were really shocked when we started the, the, the project uh, how weak uh, blinds and motors are 
And this is also why you only get two till five years of warranty. You can easily extend the lifetime of a motor and a blind by testing them. And, and, and often it happens on little details, uh, like a, a little uh, screw that is scratching on a cord and uh, the whole blind falls down, or uh, motors that are not temper temperature resistant or not durable enough. So by uh, doing your uh, procurement of front and the testing, uh, you can eliminate uh, a lot of things already. And if it happens, there is an easy access way uh, designed into the system. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, well, uh, I think we'll draw this session to a close. I'd like to thank the speakers very much for excellent presentations. And uh, the Council has some small gifts here for each of you.